And I'm going to read, I'm going to go to verse 41. If you have your Bible with you, if you would turn to Genesis 47. And I'm going to go to verse 41. You're welcome to, uh, you're welcome to read on the screen as well. Now the word of the Lord reads this. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent her younger son Jacob to sit uh, for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban and Haran. If you would skip with me over to chapter 35, we're going to skip some in the story. Somebody said, come on back home. Come on. And so we get to chapter 35, and this is exactly where we find Jacob. The word says, then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourself and change your clothes. Then Come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me whenever I have gone, wherever I have gone. God, we thank you that even in our days of distress, you are with us. We thank you that we are never alone, Father. We thank you that wherever we go, your presence is available. Your presence is near. So God, we pray that your spirit would just rest here in this place we believe you are here with us, God. Your presence is precious to us. It is better than gold. God, we ask right now that you would speak to our hearts. And Father, I ask specifically that you would just shift me, that you would replace me, and that you would speak to these, your children. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You can rest in your seats. Good morning. Happy homecoming. Is that a thing? Happy homecoming. It's good to see new faces. It's good to see, I don't want to say old faces, but the regular faces. It's good to see y'all. Listen, we, um, I want to share just a little bit with you. If I had to give it uh, a topic, it would be try again. If I had to give it a title, it would be try again. Listen, seasons are changing. We just entered fall, right? We said goodbye to our summer clothes, the season of cozy sweaters, light jackets, orange leaves, pumpkin spice, if that's your thing, is here. We're leaving the blistering heat of summer, and we're going into the hot and cold season of changes. And before we get to the winter full of good tidings, hot chocolate, and Merry Christmases, we get to rest right here in this change of season. Somebody look at somebody next to you and say, seasons are changing. I hope you'll talk with me today. For some of you, more than outside seasons are shifting. You are beginning to sense that God is shifting some things in and about you too. Our good brother Jacob here, he knows a little something about God shifting your season. We enter here in the text in Genesis, in the life and times of Jacob, the one whose name God changes to Israel, Jacob the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, whose descendants inherited the promised land, Jacob, the son of Isaac. Isaac, who was the miracle son of Abraham and Sarah, that Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
We find him here on his journey back to his homeland. But you have to know his origin story in order to appreciate how we got to where we are in the text. You're going to have to know his origin story and able to understand why it's important that we find him going back and why sometimes going back is essential to going forward. Because here's the thing, if you don't remember where you started, it's harder to appreciate where God is taking you. Jacob was born a twin, he and his brother Esau. Y'all mind if we talk a little bit of Bible? Let's go there. Listen, Jacob was born a twin. He and his brother Esau were born, right, to Isaac and Rebekah, with Esau being the oldest and Jacob coming out of the womb, literally holding the heel of his brother. This small detail seems like nothing, but it will become a reflection of their relationship. He's holding on to the heel of his brother. The Bible says that Isaac loved Esau because he was a hunter who loved outdoors and Isaac loved to eat wild game. He said, this is the son that's going to feed me. Rebecca loved Jacob because he was even tempered and loved inside. I'm a boy mom, so I understand this boy loved his mama, right? So, so Jacob is loved by Rebecca and Esau is loved by Isaac. And one day Esau comes in extremely hungry from hunting and he asks Jacob for some of the stew that he's made. And Jacob says, okay, you can have some stew in exchange for your birthright. You gotta be careful of people that when you ask them for a little help, they say, but what can I get in return? Remember, he's grabbing his heel. So Esau says, listen, brother, he says, I'm gonna be honest, I'm so hungry, I'll give you whatever you want. If you want the birthright, as long as you feed me, I'll do it. And so he makes this decision, this life-changing decision, off of a temporary feeling. Why does this matter? The birthright here, when we're talking in Scripture and you hear birthright, the birthright included the inheritance rights of the firstborn, Esau. Now, this sounds crazy when you think about him changing, exchanging his inheritance for a bowl of stew, for a bowl of soup. He said, Lord, whatever you have for me, I'm going to give it up because I'm hungry today. That's another sermon for another time. Somebody got it over there. It's fine. This sounds crazy. But here's the thing. Not only are you not yourself when you're hungry, but the real question is, what would it take for you to be talked out of what God has promised you? Because it's easy to look at the text and to judge our good brother Esau. But what would it take for you to be talked out of what God has already promised you. Is it time? Is it criticism? Is it fear? Is it things becoming harder than you expected? Is that enough to talk you out of what God has already promised you? What does it take you to, for you to be able to be talked out of what God has in store next? Are you accepting having company over covenant because you're frustrated with waiting or insecure about committing. I'm not saying it's you. I'm just saying it's somebody. Are you abandoning your vision because the cost you counted at the beginning feels a lot more expensive today? What does it take to talk you out of what God has promised you? Let's go back to our good brothers Jacob and Esau. So Esau agrees to give up his birthright. Now, the Lord had told Rebecca this very thing when she was pregnant. The Lord had said that, listen, you're having twins, and the older is going to serve the younger. And she was going to make sure that it happened herself. She said, I don't have time to wait on the Lord. I'm going to put things in motion myself. And so when Isaac is old and blinding and dying, she tricks him into speaking his final inheritance blessing over Jacob. And she does this in the most crafty way. How many know we'll do just about anything to try and force God's hand to get to what we want? And so she has Jacob put on animal skin. Because remember, his brother is a hunter. And his father can't see, and she has him go in. She fixes the food that Isaac likes, and she has him go in and feed him the food and, and, and say that he wants the blessing, right? His final blessing over him. Because remember, the birthright is this declaration of your inheritance rights. But this final blessing is the thing that seals it. And so if you would think about this like in today's current climate, 
It's kind of like if your grandma promised you, I'm going to give you my car when I go, right? But it doesn't mean anything if when they read the will, she said it didn't go to you, right? And so if you put it in that sort of context, this is that final blessing. You imagine this almost like a reading of the will. And so he goes in, except it's a lot more sacred. I want to be clear. It's a lot more sacred. So he goes in for this final blessing. And Isaac is so old and he's so sick and he's hard of seeing. And so he says, who is this? And he says, it's your son Esau. And he says he's coming in to feed him and to get his final blessing. And so Isaac, not knowing any better, he gives him his final blessing. And just as he does that, just as he finishes declaring all of the blessings of God that God has given him to put down and give to his descendants, Esau walks in. Esau walks in and he finds out that the blessing has been given to his brother. And the Bible says that he weeps in disappointment. He weeps in disappointment. And he promises where we got to in our text that he's going to kill his brother. Jacob has gotten himself in a situation. And I'm going somewhere with this, so I hope you'll stay with me. I'm telling you the whole story because I want you to see and to hear exactly what God is saying to you in it. And so I want you to hear every detail. And remember the question, here we are, what would it take for you to abandon the promise that God has given you? Before you ever opened your eyes, God had a well-designed plan and a design for your life. Sometimes that walk is long. Sometimes you're working. Sometimes you're waiting. Sometimes you get nervous and try and make it happen in our own timing like Rebecca. And sometimes we have to deal with the consequences of trying to force God's hand to move when we want. Anybody ever, you don't even have to raise your hand, just mm, ever try to push ahead of God? God, I know you told me it's going to happen, so I'm going to just, I'm going to try and put some things in motion. Here's the thing. Seasons do change, but only when God says so. Seasons change. Hear that clearly. Seasons change, but only when God says so. Some of us want to rush so far and so fast ahead of God, but how many know there is no way to work around the plan of God? At some point, you're going to learn the lesson that God has for you. Jim Ron says this. He says, you must take personal responsibility. You cannot change the circumstances, the seasons or the wind, but you can change yourself. That is something that you have charge of. We spend so much time trying to shift our season, trying to go from place to place, trying to get a word, trying to hope, Lord, send, some, send a prophetic word. Let them tell me my next is coming. We spend so much time trying to get the next thing instead of asking God, what do you want to do right now? How often do we change everything but ourselves? We're going to change jobs. We're going to change relationships. We're going to change where we live. We're going to change everything but what's in here. And we forget that we're the common denominator. Seasons change. But you have to, too. Now back to our our folks, Jacob and Rebecca, they don't wait. They decide that they're going to jump ahead. And as a result, Jacob is sent away to his uncle Laban's house to be saved. And for years, Jacob works for him for years and years trying to get ahead and then getting pulled back. Years and years in a place that he didn't plan to be in, learning things that he could, uh, couldn't control. Here's the thing. He goes and he's supposed to be there for just a few years. He thinks, I'm going to be here for about seven years. And then he finds himself in there where he's seven more. And he finds himself working and waiting. And he's figuring out very quickly that we can't force the hand of God. He's learning this lesson in real time. And finally, the Lord says, okay, listen, I want you to pick up your things, and I want you to go back, and I want you to try again. I want you to go home and try home again. He had seen the signs that the season was changing. His father-in-law was changing his wages and manipulating him into the marriage of Leah, the firstborn daughter, when he really loved Rachel. He was benefiting from Jacob's presence, but uh, refusing to be fair. He was learning some hard things in real time. And so really, he decided, you know what, God, it is time to go. 
Because we know that feeling, right? It's different when we try to force it than when we feel that something that God is saying, it's time. Some of you have been hearing that recently. God is saying, it's time. And you're like, God, I don't know. Because the other problem with that pendulum is there's one side of the pendulum that says I'm going to rush and force the hand of God. But what's the other side? I'm going to stall. And I'm going to pretend like I don't know what God is trying to tell me. I'm going to pretend like I don't have that feeling in my gut. I'm going to pretend like when I'm praying, God isn't speaking. I'm going to pretend like I don't know. I'm going to say I'm discerning instead of deciding. So he has this feeling, and then God gives him a word, and so now he goes. He goes back to his homeland, and on the way, this is where we have the very, um, uh, the very commonly taught story about him wrestling with God. This is that part when he's on his way back home. He wrestles with God. Here's the thing. He had wrestled with Esau and Laban. He had been fighting and fighting all of his life for a blessing when all along, It was only God that he really needed to wrestle with. From the time he was born, he was fighting. He was grabbing his brother's heel, thinking that the blessing had to come from someplace else. And it took him almost a lifetime to realize the blessing could only come from God. Who and what have you been wrestling with trying to get to God's blessing? What else do you think can get you to the end that only God can get you Two, and the real question is, how long are you going to keep fighting? Because he's been doing it from birth. How long are you going to keep fighting, trying to make something else work, trying to find another avenue when all we have to do is go to God? And so Jacob finally gets it right. It takes him almost a lifetime, but he gets it right, and he accepts the season that God was changing. Here's the thing. I'm not even going to hold you because it's simple. Why he, here's why he needed to return, because his obedience took him into a season that his struggle couldn't. His obedience took him into a season that hustle couldn't. His obedience took him into a season that hookups couldn't. Somebody gets that. You've been trying all the things. You're like, God, it's not even fair. Look at these other people. They're able to go past me and go faster because they got people looking out for them because they got this thing in their benefit and that thing in their benefit. And why hasn't it happened for me? Right? We do all of these things except be obedient to God. Except do what the Lord is telling us to do. And so his obedience takes him on home. And on the other side of it are two things. His obedience results in two things behind it. One, it's his inheritance. It's the thing that was always meant for him. And two, it was his restoration. It was his restored relationship with Esau. On his way back, he encounters his brother Esau, and God restores their brotherhood. And we're going to go there, but I need you to hear that for yourself. And so if you're one of my note takers, I need you to write those two things down because they matter. On the other side of his obedience is his inheritance and his restoration. And for some of you, you've been asking for these things. You're like, God, you gave me this promise. You gave me this word years ago, and I still haven't seen it. Lord, you gave this word to my mother, and she prayed over me, and I still haven't seen it. And you're like, I've done all the things. I've read the books. I signed up for workshops. I went to the seminar. I did the things. I listened to the podcast. God, I did everything. And God is like, except the thing I told you to do. Let me start a formal conference. Hold on. <laughs> because we think that other people have the answer that God has already given us. Let me tell you this cheat code. God is not going to give somebody else a word for you that he refuses to give to you yourself. Amen. And so you can keep pursuing and pressing for these words to somebody else, but God is already speaking to you if you get quiet long enough. But you got to be in a listening posture. There's only one place that is 100% guaranteed that God is always speaking. Who knows where that is? 100%. Every time you go, you, you'll hear him. And that's the word. And we're like, God, tell me something. Tell me anything. Are you in your word? When's the last time you listened to him talking? I don't hear anything, Pastor. I don't 
even know why I can't hear. Are you? He's talking. He's always saying something. But we want the workaround. And there's no way to get the inheritance without the obedience. We don't have to be like our good brother Jacob. We don't have to go the long way. We don't have to deal with all these seasons of people hurting us and manipulating us, right? Only for us to come back to where we should have been in the first place. Okay, God, I surrender. What do you want from me? What do you want me to do? And this is what I love about the Lord. I love about the Lord that even though Jacob sets this wrong thing in motion for himself, the grace of God is so good and so sufficient that he restores anyway. He said, I'm not going to leave you in that foreign place. Come on back home. Try again. Try again. So many of us are paralyzed and we're frozen in the foreign place, frozen in the place that we got ourselves in the pit, in the place where we're confused and we don't have the answers. We're stuck that we're frozen there because we think God is probably mad. I should have listened then. And God is like, try again. And on his way back, he sees the benefit of that. The Bible says that he, he comes back as he's on his way. Uh, he gets word that his brother Esau is coming. And he's so concerned that he sends out all of these gifts. He's like, I'm going to send livestock. I'm going to send all these things, and hopefully it'll calm him down. Right? And in the midst of this, this is when he wrestles with God, and he's like, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He finally gets it. He finally gets his source. Right. And on the other side of him, understanding who his source is, when he comes in contact with his brother Esau, he's like, what's all this? I'm just happy to see you. In a minute, in an instant, the Lord restored everything. In an instant. Somebody needs to get that. In an instant, God can restore everything you lost. In an instant. God can redeem your story. In a moment, God can redeem your story. You don't have to stay where you are. The enemy wants you to believe it's too and it's too much. Too many things have happened now. The devil is a liar. God's grace is sufficient. He said, come on, try again. I know you tried back then, but it's time to try again. I know you felt confused the first time, doubted if seasons would ever change, but God has given you more information in the meantime, more maturity than you had before. You weren't prepared for what you were promised back then, so try again. These hard knocks have prepared you in ways that you didn't even know. Try again because the Bible says that the Lord can use anything. He can turn it around for our good. Try again. I know you don't want to look like a knucklehead or booboo the fool, but the Bible says that the Lord will not make you ashamed. Go back to the assignment that God gave you and try again. Again, I know the last time it seemed like there were so many other people that got farther, faster. But the Lord of your promise says that when it's your time and your turn, you won't have to rush. Your inheritance is waiting behind your obedience. So try again. I know you don't think you have enough left in you to give it another go. I know exactly how that feels. You're like, Lord, I don't have nothing left. I gave you all the fuel I had the first time. But the Lord says you've been worn out and beat down. You've been worn out. And beat down, but I know a gospel singer named Donnie. And I know a Bible legend named Paul who says, after you've done all you could to stand, stand some more. You don't think you have it in you to try again. You have everything you need to try again. Everything you need to obey God is in you. Everything. Try again. You've got it. Here's the thing. I know some of you are like, listen, I can relate to Jacob because all my life I've had to fight, and I get it. I get it. But here's the thing. On his way back to start again, he was ready for his brother. And God, you're welcome to come on up because I really am not going to hold you. On his way back to start again, he was ready for his brother to want to kill him, and God did it another way. He was expecting this fight, but he went back with humility and with trust in God alone. And when he got back, it was nothing like he expected. That's the part that I want you to get. Because I'm saying try again, but I'm not saying do the same thing you did before. What I'm saying is this time go back better. This time try again, knowing that God, I've learned a lesson. God, I'm not going to do it my way anymore. God, I got it. 
I got it. We don't have to learn the same lesson twice. And maybe you're like, listen, Pastor, I already learned the same lesson three times. Fine, do it again. Try again. Don't let these seasons be for absolutely nothing. Try again. God says you're going to try again, but you're not going empty-handed. Look at what happens. He goes, Jacob goes into this hard season. He goes into Haran. He goes to Laban's house, his farm, right? He goes there to work. And when he gets there, the Bible doesn't tell us that he had all of these things. As a matter of fact, it is a rough season. He knows what it's like to be in a terrible, hard season season, but the Lord doesn't even let him leave the hard season empty-handed. Some of you need to know just that, that even if this is a hard season, even if you feel like, Lord, it's been dry, I don't even see what I have to take back to try something again, God is like, I'm not sending you empty-handed. You are not empty-handed, I promise you. If all you have is a stick, come here, Moses. Moses said, all I have is a stick, and I'll do enough with that. He raised the stick, and it parted the seed. God said, what is your stick? What is the thing that I've given you? You have enough try again. You are not going back empty-handed. And I don't know what your thing is. I don't know what you need to try again. I don't know if it's a conversation. I don't know if it's a vision. I don't know if it's a job. I don't know what it is for you. But I'm telling you that the Lord will give you everything you need for the season that he's assigning to you. Because there's no place that you're going that God hasn't already been. There's no place you're going that God isn't going before you. There's no place that God would assign you to go alone. The Lord said, I am accompanying you. I'm walking with you. And so even in this, he tells Jacob to, he says, listen, I want you to remember this moment. And he tells him to build an altar. That brings us to where we were in the start of our text. He says, I want you to build an altar and remember that the Lord was with you wherever you went. Somebody needs to build. What is your altar? What are your stones? This is what they would do in these ancient times. They would take stones along their journey. And the stones would represent the things that God had done for them. God, you kept me. Even when I came from a toxic family, you allowed me to survive. God, you kept me. Even when I was in that abusive relationship, I thought I'd never get out. God, you kept me when I was so deep and dark in a depression, and I thought I'd never see the light of day again. Yeah. God, you kept me when I thought I wasn't going to be able to pay that bill, and you came through and paid it anyway. God, you kept me when I was completely lonely, and you sent somebody to check on me. These are your songs. you got to ask yourself, yeah. what are your songs? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's hard to get back. It's hard to try again if you don't know where you've been. This is the value of the stones, and you're going to have to find out for yourself. What are my stones? Lord, what have you already done? Because those stones remind you that you can trust him. Those stones remind you that he's good. Those stones remind you that God is faithful, that God will never leave you, that God will never forsake you, that God will never abandon you. But what are your stones? Look at them and try again. Because if God gave you stones for the last season, I promise you, God is giving you stones for this one. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. There were things you're dealing with today that would have killed you five years ago. In a season you thought you'd never get out of. There are things today that would have taken you down to the white meat five weeks ago. And look at you sitting here. God is giving you everything you need for the season that he's taking you to. Try again. You don't have to abandon the assignment of God on your life. And maybe you're like, God, I don't even know what the assignment is. I'm telling you, the only way to find out is not only obedience, but listening to those stones. God, where have I already seen you? You got to trace the hand of God. You don't need to go to somebody else to tell you about, right? You don't quit doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Quit back to doing all You don't need to go to no fortune teller. You don't need nobody to read you no card, read you no question, take them for some opportunity of your card. You don't need to hear. You don't need that. Yeah. Everything you need is already put in here. Before you were born in your mother's womb, the Lord says, I knew you. Not only did he know you, he said he made a design for your life. That every day of your life has already been planned. The Lord has prepared you for where he is taking you. So try again. I don't care if it's the umpteenth time. I don't care who's looking, who's talking, who has something to say. Try again. Would you just stand on your feet? Here's the thing. This is really important. There's this movie quote that says, there is his only do 
or do not. There is no try. There's only do or do not. Uh, there is no try. And in this season, if this word is for you, if this try again word is for you, I don't want you to just try. That's not what I want you to leave with, actually. I don't want you to just try. I want you to make a decision and do it. Today is a day to decide to do it. Don't wait because delayed obedience is just disobedience. You don't have to take the long and slow route. Some of you already know what it's like to take the long and slow. You don't even have to do it. Don't delay. Do it today. You can trust God with your life today. The one who has designed it, the one who has mapped it out. You may be confused, but I can promise you this. The Lord is not. The Lord is not confused about your life. The Lord isn't confused about what to do with you. Maybe you're like, nobody even understands me. God is like, I know exactly what to do with you. But will you trust him and will you do it? Will you make a decision to say, God, I'm going to go back. I'm going to accept that this season is changing. I'm going to accept that I can't stay where I've been. And I want us to pray today. I want to pray for just a few groups of people. First, I want to pray for those in the room. And even those who may be watching this later, I feel like this sounds like God I can trust. That I've been trying everything. That I've been grasping at the heels of everything else for so long, and it's not working. I've been trying all the things, and it's not working. And I just want to grasp them to God. And you've never, you've never really done that. You've never really made that decision deep in your heart. God, I don't want you to just save me. I want you to leave me. If that's a decision that you want today, I want to pray for you. And the other group I want to pray for, you know, you feel that thing in your gut. The Lord has been telling you it's time for a change. And sometimes we think God is going to back us. I'm just going to say God will allow you to live on the level that you saw for. Like, okay. But if you feel that thing in your gut, you're like, I gotta, I gotta try again. I gotta, I gotta trust God one more time. If you know that it's you, I wanna pray for you. And so I wanna do this. I know we usually we lift hands, but there's some things that are too important to our lives to lead to chance. I don't wanna leave anything to chance. I don't wanna leave anything on the floor. I want us to to make a decision. And so if one of those groups of you, if you need to grasp at the heels of the saints for the first time, accept Jesus as Lord, I want to invite you forward so that we can pray for you. And if you want, you know that you're the one. You're one of the people that God is saying, try again. You can trust me. You, you need someone to pray for you. You want someone to pray with you. I'm telling you, the word says that the prayers of the righteous avail much. And that God responds to the collective prayers of his people. If that's you, I want to invite you up so that we can pray together. If that's you, would you come forward to me pray? If I were you, come. I wouldn't worry a thing about who was in this building. I wouldn't worry a thing about who's looking. I wouldn't worry a thing about opinions because I'm telling you the moments that have changed my life have started at all. Thank you. 
Thank you. 